Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, our webinar, uh, which was organized uh, to Eiffel licensing coordinators and librarians that are in um, Eiffel um, uh, member uh, consortium. I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Tasha Melins Cohen, who is an executive director of Counter. Uh, Counter released a new code of practice for usage reporting uh, version uh, 5.1. Oh, 5 and um, we have asked Tasha to uh, talk to us what's new in this uh, code of practice. Um, so I won't take more of uh, the time and uh, over to you, Tasha. We will be, we are recording this um, session. We'll be sharing uh, the recording as well as uh, slides. We'll make them available on our website. Uh, there'll be time at the end of the session uh, for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, please put your questions in a Q&A or a chat box. And at the end of the session, um, we'll be, uh, asking uh, Tasha to answer them. So Tasha, over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Eiffel, generally for inviting me to speak. I'm sorry that I couldn't present in December as originally planned. Uh, I, I unfortunately caught a nasty bug and couldn't speak. So here we are today, and I'm going to talk to you about release 5.1 of the counter code of practice. If you came to the, the counter webinar that I did in November, you will have heard this before. I'm not going to be offended if you drop off, uh, but hopefully a lot of you will find this information to be new. We will cover what has changed from release five and why that change was made. Uh, what report providers, so that's the publishers and the aggregators are doing to remain compliant and what report consumers, that's you guys, need to do to prepare um, because this becomes live, becomes the official counter code of practice in January next year. We will also touch on how release 5.1 is optimized for open access. So we'll get to that in a moment. Just as a bit of background, um, Hopefully you all know that we are a not-for-profit membership organization. Our goal is to bring the knowledge community together to agree a standard for measuring and reporting content usage. We've been around since 2003, and so far we've had more than 280 platforms from dozens and dozens of publishers covering almost every form of digital content from books and journals to news and multimedia and interactive tools who've adopted the code of practice. Now, since 2003, obviously the code has evolved to better address the changing nature of digital content and to meet the needs of librarians and consortia and everybody else. What I will say is that I often hear that counter changes too frequently. We have only released, we, we've only made major changes on average every five years since we were founded in 2003. And every time we have made those major changes, it has been deeply informed by feedback from the community and carefully thought through. And this iteration, release 5.1, is no exception. So, why bother? Why have a standard for measuring usage? Um, hopefully you all agree uh, that we need to know consistently from one platform to the next to the next that the usage you are seeing is the same. It's measured in the same way to the same standards so that you can compare not just across platforms, but over time. And this is something that Countermetrics offers, which web analytics cannot. So web analytics, typically, you don't know how the metrics are being generated. 
They vary over time, often without explanation or warning, and they are typically commercial products driven by the needs of commercial players rather than informed and defined by libraries as well as publishers. So we have that level of trust. That's why Counter is here. That's why we want to stay here. And we hope that you are seeing benefit from that as well. So 5.1, why did we bother? Because I will tell you, it was 18 months of really hard work. And I know Lorraine isn't here today, but um, Lorraine was, was in charge for the first nine months of it. And she will tell you how hard it was. So we started in September, 2021 with reviewing uh, release five of the code of practice. And what we were taking into consideration was whether release five was fit to be used for open content. Everyone knows that open access is changing the way that the knowledge community works. And to accommodate open access, we really had to adapt the code to, to sort of really optimize it for open access usage. And I will explain that as we go through. We also wanted to look at bibliodiversity, by which I mean the different types of content. Um, you know, we, we very much think about books, journals and databases in counter world, but not everything is a book, a journal or a database. So we really wanted to make sure that we could cover newer types of resources like interactive tools and non-traditional content. And while we were doing that, we decided we were going to put a lot of time into making things more standard, more simple, and just generally cleaning up some of the confusion that had crept in. Now, I know that changes to the code create work for everybody. So as I said, we try to keep our releases infrequent and we try to make the changes from one release to the next as small as possible. It also takes us at least two years to go from thinking about a release to publishing it, and then another 12 months before it comes into force, preferably longer. So we really try and, and make this uh, well thought through and with plenty of preparation time for everybody. So what are the changes? The big one, and the one that I'm personally quite excited about is the concept of item becoming the unit of reporting. I've mentioned that improved open access reporting was one of our major objectives. And that means that we have to be reporting at the level of the item rather than the title. So that means we're looking at the chapter or the article rather than the book or the journal. Now, for most content types, Counter only offers item level metrics. So if you're looking at journal usage, you're seeing the usage of every article within that journal. For release five, however, we had some special rules for books, which meant that we weren't always tracking chapters. We were tracking the whole book. In release 5.1, we have made book tracking the same as all other content types. And if you look at the table on this slide, that's a really good illustration. So under release five, if a user has chosen to download a book that has 10 chapters, you will only see one investigation and one request for the whole book which means you don't know how many chapters have been used. In release 5.1, the publisher can report usage of chapters more accurately. So that 10 chapter book download will have 10 investigations and 10 requests, but we're not inflating the book metrics because there is still a single unique title investigation or request. So we're, we're really trying to make it so that everything is counted the same way, 
but you can still see if you want to see just total title usage, that's very straightforward. Um, two things to note here. We know there are some books that are only available as a single file and the publisher or the report provider cannot identify the book segments, the chapters within that. So in that case, the book is still one single item as well as being a single title. We are not permitting publishers to guess at how many chapters there might be and inflate their metrics that way. We've also made a tweak to cater to, to very large books with hundreds or thousands of book segments. So something like an encyclopedia. And we've done that by introducing a new data type called a reference work, which really does take me very neatly to our second set of changes. Um, as a knock-on effect of the move to item level reporting, we don't need section types anymore. Section types used to be used in conjunction with a data type to allow really granular usage reporting. So for a book, you would have data type book and section type chapter. We don't need that anymore. So what we've got instead is a slightly longer list of data types. So a book segment or a chapter is now a data type in and of itself. And it maps to a parent data type called book. Um, so you'll see on the left of this slide, there are six data types that are explicitly associated with a parent data type. Um, and then there are the, the sort of granular multimedia or database or search data types. With this expansion of the list and the removal of section types, we've made reporting much more consistent and straightforward. So you can have different levels of granularity with the, the data types and parent data types without uh, exploding the reports to being truly enormous. Another aspect of the code, which has been amended very specifically to facilitate open access reporting, are the counter access types. And these help to clarify whether usage was subscription content, open access or free. Now, given that Delta Thinker reporting that 50% of 2022 articles were published under an open access model, we think this clarification is very timely. I'm going to start before I describe these by saying that we know these are not perfect definitions. Over the last two releases, so release 5.1 and the earlier release 5, Counter's technical advisory group and executive committee have spent altogether more than two and a half years trying to agree how to define access types. It's very, very difficult to do. So we started from the position of we cannot and should not try to define the license under which something needs to be published in order for it to be open access. So we don't specify that open needs to be CCBY or any other kind of Creative Commons license. We also cannot and should not specify the business model under which something has been published. So we don't specify that, for example, subscribe to open should be reported as controlled. We, it's none of our business. So the access types that you see here, controlled, open and three to read, free to read. Controlled haven't changed at all. At the time of the usage, the content item was restricted to authorised users. So that might be behind a paywall or it might be free content that is only available if you register because there is a barrier to access. Open, which used to be called OA Gold, and as I said, we don't want to reference business models. We have defined open 
by saying, at the time of use, this is available to everyone, regardless of whether they are authorised or not, under an open access model. It applies where the report provider, that's the publisher in non-counter terminology, has asserted that the content is open access. We don't care about the license. We don't care if it's in a hybrid or a fully open access journal. And it may have been open from the day of publication or after expiry of an embargo. And we have that caveat about embargoes because a lot of repositories are producing counter reports and want to accurately report that they have open access materials even if those materials were initially embargoed due to the publisher's requirements. Hopefully you will remember that we had uh, an access type called OA delayed that was in release five, but never actually implemented. Uh, we don't need that anymore because uh, we have open, including embargo, uh, embargoed content. And finally, we have free to read, which used to be restricted for use by repositories. Um, but a lot of publishers make a lot of content freely available and want to be able to report on that accurately, separately from the stuff that is controlled. So this is material that may or may not have been controlled in the past and may or may not become controlled again in the future. So that would be something like promotional materials, like the COVID content that was made available for a year. That would have been under free to read. Things that I know uh, some people have queried in the past. Uh, the access type in a counter report only relates to the platform producing that report. So if you are looking, for example, at an EBSCO report that includes content they have scraped from open access journals, because EBSCO is a controlled database, that will show up as controlled. Um, I know not everybody likes that, but there is, as I've said, no mechanism for us to, to track the licenses under which something is published. So it's it's related to the, the platform that produces the report. Um, and the other thing that we have said is that items can have only one access type. So if journal metadata is freely available, but the full text is restricted to subscriber usage, usage of the metadata needs to be reported as controlled as well. So publishers can't say there's a load of free to read stuff and here's the usage of it. It all needs to be reported in one way. Uh, something to be aware of, the TRB1 and TRJ1 standard views of the title report historically excluded book or journal content classified as OA gold um, because of the way those are configured. In release 5.1, they will exclude both open and free to read content. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you will know that I always say to please use the title report instead of any of the standard views because you have all of the information and you can filter out what you don't want to see. Um, but if you do want to keep using the, the standard views, please be aware that they have slightly changed. OK. I think I have covered all the complexities of access types. So moving on. The technical stuff. I will try to make this as user friendly as possible. We included several upgrades to the counter harvesting API, which you probably know as Sushi. And those upgrades were designed to make the protocol more robust and more useful. So for example, we know because we've had so many emails uh, that IP-based authentication for the counter harvesting API was fragile and was causing real problems for picking up um, picking up counter reports. So we have removed IP-based authentication as an option for release 5.1. 
your reports are still secure, you still have your customer ID and your institution ID as a mechanism for securing, uh, for, for obtaining only your reports. And a lot of report providers are replacing IP authentication with API key instead, which is more robust. But that will make a change. So if you've been using IP, be prepared that that is going away from uh, release 5.1 onwards. We have made some other changes to the endpoints. So for example, the status endpoint where you're checking whether a specific uh, harvesting API service is live, that needs to be openly available for everybody. So you can just check without logging in. Um, so you can see if something's there quickly. Uh, we've expanded the reports endpoint so that you can see um, from that endpoint the first and last months for which data are available. So you don't have to sort of guess about whether you can get information for December 2023, for example. You will be able to see that on the reports endpoint. Uh, and we've added some uh, extra parameters for the common extensions to counter reports. On the JSON side, so this is the file format that is delivered when you call a report uh, from the Harvesting API. Um, we, we've upgraded our JSON to use the Open API 3.1 specification, which means the reports themselves are smaller and more compact, and the files are easier to produce and to validate and to use. Uh, we also discovered that there was some extra stuff in the JSON reports uh, that wasn't in the tabular reports. So we've cleaned up that mismatch. So there's no more duplicate information. So you, you, there was a load of unnecessary extras in, in the original JSON reporting. We have, as a result of all of these changes, put together, had to move all of the documentation from our old service to a new tool called Stoplight. It's still freely accessible for anybody who wants to see it, and you can link it from, I want to say section nine of the Code of Practice, but it's it's in whichever is the sushi section in the Code of Practice links directly to Stoplight. There's a whole raft of smaller amendments and clarifications in release 5.1. So for example, components, which were an aspect of the item report, are now optional rather than mandatory, which we hope will encourage more publishers to make the item report available because it significantly reduces the size of that report. I'm only going to go into detail on two of these uh, items. One is the registry link. So hopefully you have all used the counter registry, uh, which is the list of report providers and the platforms that have been audited as being counter compliant. To make it easier for libraries to see the current compliance status we are going to be requiring all report providers to put a link to their registry record in the report header from release 5.1 onwards. So if you see a report that has a blank registry link, or if somebody has got a registry link that doesn't actually match to their platform, you know they're probably not counter compliant and please do send me a message because I would like to follow up with those people. The other thing that I'm going to flag is the global item reports. I have spoken a lot already about open access, centering the need to understand usage at the granular item level rather than relying on journal or book level information. That usage also needs to be global, by which I mean inclusive of all user activity rather than restricted to activity from a particular institution as in a traditional counter report. So in release 5.1, we have included a recommendation that all report providers, and particularly those offering open access content, 
should provide a global item report. The rationale for this is the claim that open access drives increased usage. Without using the same metrics measured in the same way, it is very difficult to validate that claim. So when publishers start offering the global item report, the community will finally have a like-for-like -like usage comparison of controlled versus open content. Um, as an aside, I know when the Microbiology Society, uh, I, I used to be at the Microbiology Society, when we dropped our paywall at the start of COVID, we went back and looked at the usage metrics for the previous months, and 80% of our usage could not be associated with any particular institution, even before we dropped the paywall. So global usage of scholarly content, I suspect, is significantly bigger than what is being reported to institutions. Um, other publishers have confirmed they've seen similar trends. This is not a one-off. Okay, having rattled through the key changes, what do you guys need to do to get ready for this? This is my standard cycle that I do for anything involving any change. I review the documentation, which in this case is the code of practice, but also if you don't want to read the code of practice, and I really would not blame you if you don't want to read the code of practice, we have a whole suite of educational materials. So we have friendly guides, videos, and one page downloadable infographics for all the different aspects of the code, including one specifically about changes. After reviewing the documentation, go and check your systems, whether you're using, uh, you're just using Google Sheets or Excel, whether you're using Alma, whether you're using uh, another harvesting tool, whatever it is that your systems rely on, work out where there are gaps, where you need to make changes, what you need to do, and then do the work to prepare for that. There are very comprehensive sample reports for all of the different report types in the code of practice already. So unlike release five, where our samples were very short, these are big, expansive sample reports that you can use to test your systems even before the publishers have started releasing R5.1 um, compliant reports. So you can use those to check. And then if you need to make any further changes, you can go around the loop again. But please, please start preparing. Um, I would rather not get to January 2025 and have panicked emails saying, we're not ready, we're not ready. <laughs> So beyond the basics, um, report providers need to do a lot of work on planning, on launch, on overlap management. I have spoken to all of the major providers, everyone who's in the, in the registry at the moment, they are all working on this already. They are all worrying about this already. And they are all worrying about whether libraries are ready for this as well. So for you guys, for report consumers, the stuff that you need to think about is how you are going to harvest, so that's get hold of, and use and ingest these new reports. As I've said, they are not radically different, but they're different enough that you will need to do some changes to your systems. I would also suggest looking at the metrics that you're currently using. Um, so I was recently contacted by a Canadian consortium, for example, who are, are still using total item investigations to calculate cost per download uh, when we recommend using the unique item requests. So have a look at the metrics that you're using for your key performance indicators and decide whether they are still the right ones to use. I am very happy to help. If anybody needs, needs some assistance with that, I'm very happy to help you. You can always, get in touch with me at my shiny new email address. Uh, sorry, I'm very excited about this. <laughs> I have wanted to update our emails for a while. And as of Friday, you can get hold of me at tasha at countermetrics.org. 
Um, as I said, happy to help at any point. So, oh, bang on, I was aiming to get to questions at half past. These are the ones that were previously submitted. So I'll go through those and then I'm going to open this up to Q&A. So the first question that came in was, why do why doesn't Counter require publishers to offer usage statistics in other formats like PDF or DOCX? Uh, and the simple answer is that trying to work with an enormous spreadsheet in PDF format or Word format is, is just horrible. <laughs> it's really, really difficult. Um, so it's it's just not a viable way to work with fairly chunky data sets. Um, it's quite easy if you want to convert a spreadsheet into PDF, you, you can. Excel does have a save as PDF option. Um, I'm just not sure why you would. Uh, sorry, that's not a very helpful answer because it's sort of, why would you want to? Um, the second question, oh, sorry, uh, just to finish the first one about formats, um, counter specifies JSON, as I've already said, which can be converted into all kinds of different formats and TSV. And the reason that we say TSV is because it doesn't matter what spreadsheet program you're using, all of them work with TSV files. So whether that's Google Sheets, Excel, Another spreadsheet program, Alma, all of them can work with TSV files. Um, they're just very, very flexible. Uh, and then moving on to the JSON question. Uh, does Counter provide a standard for JSON file structure for errors? And yes, uh, as well as sample reports in TSV and Excel format, you can see the sample reports in JSON. Uh, we also have a validation tool which goes through reports uh, that publishers load and checks to see if they are in the right format. We also have a long list of error codes that publishers should deliver if they have a problem with any of the, the reporting. However, there's always a however. Um, we know that not all publishers are counter compliant. We have not been able to force every publisher to do the right thing and become counter compliant as much as we would like to. Um, so I know from emails that some people have sent me that they that some librarians are downloading files thinking they're counter reports because that's how they've been labeled by the publisher and they aren't. They are not even closely associated with counter reports. And that's why we've started requesting the registry link in all report headers so that you have a way of checking that yourselves rather than relying on me. So I hope I've answered those questions adequately. If you are the person who asked those questions and you want to follow up, please do pop that in the chat or the Q&A. If not, over to you, please ask me questions. Thank you, Tasha. I don't see any questions in neither of the boxes. So, <clears throat> yeah, so what's, from your experience in talking with, with uh, already with publishers, so from January 1st, 2025, what do you expect what will be happening? How many of them will you know, be able to comply or are we going to have for some time a little bit of a situation <laughs> where, you know, will we have mixed, um, mixed reporting? So I would love to say that, yes, absolutely, everybody will be ready from the 1st of January. I am pragmatic enough to know that that has never happened in the whole history of Counter. So I am not going to say that on the 1st of January, 2025, everybody will be ready. 
we have required a three month overlap period. So all publishers need to continue offering release five until the end of March 2025. I am speaking to every publisher at least once every two months over the course of this year to see what their progress is. I've already had one publisher say, we're ready, can we start offering release five, uh, release 5.1 now? Which I've said, sure, you can do it as early as you please, as long as you keep offering release five in, in parallel. I can't make any promises. All I can do is push the publishers and also ask, you know, I've said this before, Librarians have a lot of power to make their customer, uh, to make, you know, you are the customer. If you're all pushing your publishers to make the migration to release 5.1, that's a lot more powerful than just me saying, by the way, you have to do this. So, you know, please work with me to help encourage them. <laughs> yeah, it will be useful and especially I welcome this um, access typology it will be interesting to see yes i think so i think so uh if there are no more questions shall we give everybody some time back in their day yes we can <laughs> yes yeah, so um thank you very much uh tasha will definitely be in touch if we'll have issues because we are using sushi. So we'll be going through this uh, checking exercise. Excellent. And, um, we'll learn ourselves by doing it. And uh, also we'll be able to help our partners through our learning as well. Fantastic. And in case anyone has missed it, we are having a counter conference in May. Uh, on the 16th of May, which is open to all members of Counter. Uh, and if you want to talk to us about what you've done with Counter, please submit a proposal by the end of this month because I'm excited. It's the first time we've done a conference and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I wish you a good conference and Thank you. we'll definitely be in touch. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.